Thank you for joining me in my studio slash study for this week's episode. Teddy Roosevelt, born October 27, 1858, was the 26th president of the U.S. and inspiration for one of the most amusing characters in this week's episode, Arsenic and Old Lace. Living one of the most prolific lives of any U.S. president or really any person ever. Theodore Roosevelt became the 26th president of the U.S. after the assassination of his predecessor, William McKinley, and Teddy took on his new duties with stride, as he always had, and gave the West Wing a bit of his signature bully. And to that end, his use of bully as an exclamation of condemnation is the most singular example of his linguistic influence. Like Harding's normalcy, and please, for the love of God, I beg you, just say normality, please. And Kennedy's vigor, the phrase Roosevelt began many of his letters with was bully for you, and this will be forever emblematic of his presidency. Teddy was an American conservationist, naturalist, writer, and historian who also happened to serve as the president of the United States from 1901 until 1909. As president, Roosevelt emerged as a leader for the Republican Party and became a driving force for antitrust and progressive policies. The larger than life life Teddy lived began relatively unassumingly. A wealthy, though sickly child with debilitating asthma, Roosevelt repeatedly experienced sudden nighttime asthma attacks that replicated the experience of being smothered to death, terrifying both Theodore and his parents. Doctors had no cure. Nevertheless, he was energetic and mischievously inquisitive. His lifelong interest in zoology began at age seven when he saw a dead seal at a market. Now, I'm all for encouraging kids' interest, but why was there a dead seal at a market? Um, I, I don't, you know, 1865, what can I tell you? At age nine, he recorded his observation of insects in a paper titled The Natural History of Insects succinct and to the point. Interestingly enough, as a child, Roosevelt witnessed the Abraham Lincoln funeral procession. Then seven, the young Roosevelt can be seen in a window at his grandfather's mansion, watching the procession through New York City in April, 1865. Family trips abroad, including tours of Europe and Egypt, shaped Teddy's perspective. And while hiking with his family in the Alps, Roosevelt discovered the benefits of physical exertion to minimize his asthma and bolster his spirits. Thereafter, he began a heavy regimen of exercise and found a boxing coach to teach him to fight and strengthen his body. And I think that's just bully. While at Harvard, Roosevelt continued his strenuous lifestyle and participated in rowing and boxing. Roosevelt was also a member of Alpha Delta Phi Literary Society, later the Fly Club, the Delta Kappa Epsilon Fraternity, and the prestigious Porcelain Club. Oh, and by the way, he was also editor of the Harvard Advocates, you know, when he had spare time. In 1880, Roosevelt graduated Phi Beta Kappa from Harvard Magna Cum Laude. After graduation, Teddy gave up his earlier ambitions of studying natural science and decided to attend law school, moving back into the family's home in New York City. Not unlike what Mortimer did in a way with his aunt's boarding home in Brooklyn. Although Roosevelt was a bright student, he often found law irrational. Go figure. I wonder what he would think of our judicial system today. 
In 1880, Roosevelt married socialite Alice Hathaway Lee. Their daughter, Alice Lee Roosevelt, who deserves an episode all her own, and I promise you I will find a way to get an episode for Alice, was born February 12th, 1884. Two days later, the new mother died of undiagnosed kidney failure. In his diary, Roosevelt wrote a large X on the page and then, the light of my life has gone out. This day left him devastated and he recuperated by buying and operating a cattle ranch in the Dakotas. In 1884, Teddy built Elkhorn Ranch 35 miles north of the then booming town of Medora, North Dakota. There, Roosevelt learned to ride Western style, rope and hunt on the banks of the Little Missouri River. And Roosevelt successfully led efforts to organize ranchers to address the problems of overgrazing and other shared concerns, issues that are still being argued over today. Teddy felt compelled to promote conservation and formed the Boone and Crockett Club whose primary goal was the conservation of large game animals and their habitats. While there, Teddy also served as deputy sheriff in Billings County, North Dakota. And during this time, he and two ranch hands hunted down three boat thieves. Now I have to tell you, any single facet of Teddy's life could easily be made into a movie. I want to see that movie. Theodore Roosevelt, future president, deputy sheriff, North Dakota, hunting down boat thieves. Come on, we've got to make it happen. Returning to the East Coast after three years, Roosevelt immersed himself in the politics he had longed for as a law student. And eventually in 1901, he assumed the presidency at age 42 and remains to this day the youngest person to become president of the United States. As a leader of the progressive movement, he championed his square deal domestic policies, which called for fairness for all citizens, breaking of bad trusts, regulation of railroads, and the Pure Food and Drug Act. At the time, the most prevalent form of cancer was stomach, caused by tainted and impure foods. During his presidency, Roosevelt prioritized conservation and inspired by his westward adventures, established national parks, of which Yellowstone was first, to preserve our nation's national resources. In foreign policy, he focused on Central America, where he began construction of the Panama Canal. In this week's episode, Teddy Brewster was instructed to bury the bodies in the locks of the canal and was told the men died of yellow fever. Of course, yellow fever was a real concern for the real Teddy, who in 1904 took over the building of the Panama Canal. Prior to that, over 22,000 workers died during the French effort to build the canal, many of them from malaria and yellow fever. Roosevelt appointed Colonel William Gorgas to the post of Chief Sanitary Engineer. Gorgas had previously success, Gorgas had successfully eradicated yellow fever from Cuba in 1901 after the discovery that mosquito larvae carried yellow fever. At the time, many people believed yellow fever was caused by, quote, bad air resulting from filth and decomposing manner that was spread by fomites, things likely to be contaminated by the fever victim, such as bedding and clothing. However, many believed Gorgas was wasting time and money by going after mosquito breeding grounds. However, Roosevelt threw his support behind Gorgas enabling him to deploy 4,000 people to fumigate homes, put up screens, 
eliminate standing water and spray drains with oil to kill mosquito larvae. By December 1905, there were no deaths from yellow fever in Panama. His successful efforts to broker the end of the Russo-Japanese War won him the 1906 Nobel Peace Prize, making him the first American and American president to win a Nobel Prize. As president, he mentored his close ally, William Taft, to succeed him in the presidency. However, Roosevelt grew frustrated with Taft and founded the new Progressive Party and ran in the 1912 election. On October 14th, while arriving at a campaign event in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Roosevelt was shot seven feet away in front of the Gilpatrick Hotel by delusional saloon keeper, John Fleming Schrank who believed that the ghost of assassinated President William McKinley had directed him to kill Roosevelt. I guess like Mortimer Brewster, insanity ran in Shrank's family. I'm sorry, not only did it run in the family, it sprinted. <laughs> the bullet lodged in Teddy's chest after penetrating his steel eyeglass case after passing through a 50 page thick single folded copy of his speech titled progressive cause greater than any individual roosevelt was carrying in his jacket shrank was immediately disarmed and captured by roosevelt stenographer albert e martin as he attempted to fire a second time and might have been lynched by the crowd had Roosevelt not shouted for Shrank to remain unharmed. Teddy assured the crowd he was all right, then ordered police to take charge of Shrank and make sure no violence was done to him. An experienced hunter and anatomist, Roosevelt correctly concluded that since he was not coughing blood, the bullet had not reached his lung. He declined hospital attention immediately and instead delivered a 90 minute speech with blood seeping into his shirt. Only after finishing his address did he accept medical attention. An x-ray showed that the bullet lodged in his chest muscle, but did not penetrate the pleura. Doctors concluded it would be less dangerous to leave it in place than to attempt to remove it and Roosevelt carried that bullet with him for the rest of his life. Ultimately, Roosevelt lost the presidential election, but not one to let a presidential defeat get his spirits down. Roosevelt led a four month expedition to the Amazon basin where he nearly died of tropical disease. Where was Gorgas then? <laughs> Seven years later, on the night of January 5th, 1919, Roosevelt suffered breathing problems. After receiving medical attention, he felt better and went to bed. Roosevelt's last words were, please let out that light, James. Between 4 a.m. and 4.15 the next morning, Roosevelt died at the age of 60 in his sleep after a blood clot traveled to his lungs. Polls of historians and politicians rank him as one of the greatest presidents in American history. Today, he is heralded as the architect of the modern presidency, as a world leader who boldly reshaped the office to meet the needs of a new century and redefined America's place in the world. And go ahead and give that subscribe button a good bully so you never miss a thing. We appreciate our listeners, our viewers, our supporters. New episodes of the Real Relationships podcast drop every Thursday, as do episodes of this show. Again, we thank you for your support. Stay safe, and we will see you soon.